Welcome back, everybody. This is Mike Waller, and I'll be your host for this next session of the Entrepreneurship and Small Business Ownership Workshop Series that we're conducting on behalf of the Willow Creek Employment uh, Services Team. And this is going to be part number two, and the subject matter for part number two is Pathways to Business Ownership. You can see that it's part of a multi-part series that we're offering to give you some insights of what it might mean to be in business for yourself. So let's begin. I believe it's always a good place to start to engage with God before you start learning or before you start, certainly before you start any business. But uh, this is a, a, a verse from a Proverbs, uh, verse uh, 14 from uh, chapter 11, that simply says, where there's no guidance, a people fails but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. So my recommendation to you is always, before you consider making a serious move, like getting into a business for yourself, that you seek out good counsel. If you have a spouse or significant other, you certainly wanna engage them and make them a part of the conversation. But in addition to that, you're gonna to wanna to have other resources to tap into that will give you insights and guidance, such as a business coach, an attorney, a CPA, and so on. Now, as I mentioned in the first uh, session, I uh, said that you may feel a bit of a fire hose effect with uh, all the information I'm gonna put uh, before you. And it's really designed to get you to think about this very seriously, because it is a very serious subject. And I'm again gonna say to you, look for nuggets, gold nuggets or chicken nuggets. You get to decide which or which based upon where your frame of reference and frame of thought is. So, Having said that, one of the things I brought out in the first session was an important place that you have to start is to understand what you are trying to accomplish by being a business for yourself. And I created this little acrostic that I refer to as ILWI. But I think there are at least four dimensions to consideration of how the business would fit into your life in a very holistic way. Certainly income, but then there's the lifestyle element of it, the creation of wealth, and then the establishment of equity in the business so that at some point in time, if and when you do decide to sell, that uh, you have created an asset that, uh, again, contributes to your wealth uh, and gives you, a, again, an asset that uh, can be sold, hopefully, for a significantly higher price than you might have invested in the business. I want to tell you a story. This is an individual by the name of Jeff Miller. Jeff is the owner of a business called Divine Signs. Now, I'm going to share this story with you to give you perspective. Jeff is an individual that I have known for decades now. When I started my business back in 2003, Jeff was actually my very first client. And Jeff was a refugee from corporate America, you might say. He was an executive with a firm called Sierra Wireless, and he was an individual who traveled all over the world consistently. He headed up their OEM sales organization. and. Jeff had a story that was very similar to mine. He traveled almost continuously. And he had made a decision in 2002, uh, late 2002, early 2003, to essentially move on to do something else. He knew what he didn't want to do, but he really didn't know what he did want to do in terms of a business. So he was looking at multi-alternatives, as some of you may also be. He was considering job uh, opportunities, but he really had... He had the desire to do something on his own. So Jeff and I got connected. We had known one another at that point in time for about 10 years. And this goes back, this was uh, oh, roughly February of 2003. And uh, Jeff was uh, interested in exploring some business ownership possibilities. So I worked with Jeff and we kind of figured out what was his ill week. Got a sense of what his income expectations were. Got a really good perspective on his lifestyle desires and the desire to create wealth and equity through some kind of a business. We narrowed the field to probably a dozen different components that were important to Jeff, but we probably focused on four key ones. One, he wanted to do a business in the community of Schaumburg, which is where he had lived for many, many years, and he thought it'd be great to be involved in the business community of Schaumburg. Second, he wanted to do the business with his wife, Michelle. Um, Michelle, by choice, had been the stay-at-home mom as Jeff traveled uh, around the world for his businesses uh, that he had worked for in corporate America. And uh, they thought that 
well, it'd be great to be able to do a business together, be able to work in a business together. Thirdly, he wanted to have his kids engaged in the business so that, number one, he could help them see whether or not there were some possibilities in the world of business that might make sense whenever they went on to do their college education. Because at this point in time, just kids were, well, great age ranges were from nine to uh, 17 years old, all lined up on the runway, getting ready to, uh, to go off to uh, college before very long. Fourth thing though, which is probably one of the more important things to him was he really wanted to have time to engage in his kids after school activities. Uh, some of his kids, his youngest was, as a matter of fact, was very uh, active in sports and Jeff thought, gee, it'd be great to be able to spend more time with Michael involved in uh, his supporting his sports activities, uh, coaching, managing, sponsoring with jerseys with the name of his business on the back. Jeff and I worked together and uh, got a good, again, frame of reference, what he was looking for. I saw possibilities for him. And I went out and I, I dug out some ideas and some particulars and presented them to Jeff. And I said, Jeff, there's some businesses I'd like you to take a look at. Probably showed him four different opportunities, I believe, if my memory serves me correct. And three of the opportunities certainly appealed to the visceral side of who Jeff was as a person. But the heart of who he was was a sales general management type of an individual. I showed him a commercial sign making idea and the response was classic. He was sitting across the desk from me with his wife, Michelle, and I presented this idea and it was a very stoic response. He did everything but roll his eyes and elbow his wife and say, boy, that's a dumb idea. Where did he come up with that one? And I could read his body language. I simply said to him, Jeff, I can tell that this idea doesn't really uh, light your fire. But I said, here's what I want you to do. Trust me for a while. I want you to look into the business because it's not a franchise, but it's kind of similar to a franchise. They essentially help you to get established in this business that you don't know anything about. Because the mechanics of it, you'll learn very, very quickly. But you have skill sets that might make really good sense for you and the opportunity to fulfill a majority of the um, items on your ILWI checklist uh, might be there. So take a look at it. He agreed to follow my advice, did so, and lo and behold, what happens? Uh, approximately um, six to eight weeks later, he ends up buying into this concept and establishing himself in the business of commercial sign making, uh, with uh, the brand name of Divine Signs. And there's a whole story behind the name Divine Signs. It has to do with the fact that Jeff is a survivor of an airplane crash in which 113 people died and over 160 people survived. He's one of a small group of a dozen that walked off of a, a monstrous well, fireball explosion when the plane crashed that, uh, well, he's one of those survivors that has a great story to tell that has to do with why they named it Divine Signs. Today, uh, he's in the business uh, for over 17 years now. Incredibly successful seven figure plus uh, revenue business that he's done incredibly well with. I share that story with you for this reason. Don't always think you have to go into something that you're truly passionate about or something that is related to what your career has been up to that point in time because if you've learned other skills, you might find those skills can be applied in a lot of different businesses, but you have to make sure that the business can fulfill more than less of your ill we expectations. Otherwise you're going to find yourself in disappointment. So there's my story. So what are the options? Well, as we did explain in part one, we really kind of explored the idea of whether or not business ownership is really the right pathway for you. But if you've concluded that you really want to explore it, you're probably going to find that there are probably three different pathways that you can potentially take. You can create and birth your own business. You can buy something that somebody else has already created, or you could potentially consider licensing a franchise. Those are the three primary pathways that someone might find available to them as they think about getting into business for themselves. So a couple of stats I want you to remember. Now, again, this precedes the recent COVID-19 um, impact upon our economy, but 29 million. There are roughly 29 million businesses that exist within our country. They range from all the big brand names that you all recognize, such as IBM, Walmart, Motorola, um, pick one, all the way down to little one-person businesses like my own business. They generate close to $20 trillion worth of annual revenue that's commonly referred to as gross national product. 
So I just want you to make a mental note of those two numbers for a moment, and you know, I'll show you where they're relevant. So let's start first and talk a little bit about the independent startups. What does that mean? Well, it's a business essentially that is your idea, it's your creation, you get to plan it out, you get to brand it however you want to, and oh, by the way, you also have to create all the systems that will support that business. Now, when I refer to the term systems, you might wonder, well, what does he mean? Well, if you have a desire to have employees, there's an HR system that goes behind that that makes sure that you're in compliance with government regulations as it relates to hiring and firing of people. If you uh, are going to uh, generate revenue and have expenses, you're going to have to have a, an accounting system. You're going to have to have some mechanism by which you may actually operate the business. So what is the operating set of instructions or the, uh, the operating plans, if you will. Um, a whole lot of those kind of systems are all part of something that you have to create. Back to those two numbers I mentioned to you, the 29 million, roughly 90 plus percent of all those 29 million businesses represent what we would refer to as independent startups, something that somebody started from scratch. They drive almost 60% of that $20 trillion worth of revenue. So it's a substantial portion, but it's not as big. It doesn't map to the 90% plus. But here's the thing. Remember what I told you in the last session? Almost 30% of brand new startup kind of businesses, again, not so much franchises, but independent startup businesses, fail by the end of year two. So it's just something to keep in mind, not intended to scare you, but just to say, hey, there's a lot of risk when you try to do something completely on your own. Now here's a name you may or may not recognize, Reed Hoffman. I'm gonna suspect that many of you that are watching this might be participants in a, uh, a set of software, a, um, a social media, if you will, uh, called LinkedIn. And Reed Hoffman is definitely an entrepreneurial kind of a person. Here's the way he describes it. He says, entrepreneurship is throwing yourself off a cliff and assembling an airplane on the way down. And what he's really trying to say was, is that it's not always well mapped out for you. And you end up that you're figuring things out as your business is running, where things don't work exactly like you thought that they would. Thought it was a great quote, thought I would share it with you. Second pathway, business acquisitions. The nice thing about almost every business is that one of two things will typically happen. Maybe, maybe three things. One, the business will get sold at some point in time to an outside person or organization. Secondly, the business might be dissolved. Thirdly, the business might be transferred to other family members or individuals that you may be close to. Uh, that's the pathway in which you can typically uh, find an existing business to purchase. Um, the nice thing about it is, is that both franchises as well as independent businesses are bought and sold day in and day out, just like houses are. Nice thing about it, everything's negotiable. It's the beauty of it. It's like when you buy a house, seller has a selling price, buyer has a number in mind, you make an offer, seller may or may not agree, you may dicker back and forth and negotiate a bit, and you may conclude upon something or you both walk away. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that when you buy an existing business though, is you acquire both the goodwill and the bad will. Most small businesses, when I say small businesses, those that generate under a million dollars a year, maybe up to one to $5 million in revenue, let's call it that. Um, owners are very, very sig play sig significant roles in those kind of businesses typically. And you got to keep in mind that owners are going to be very, very uh, proprietary about the information about their business. So it can be very difficult to pull out information from an owner. They'll generally share with you everything associated with their P&L uh, and tax returns, hopefully. Uh, but if you had an interest in getting in touch with their employees or their clientele, they're probably going to say, no, I'm not going to allow you to do that because they don't know that I'm selling my business. In all honesty, most really good businesses get sold through word of mouth, but there are some other alternatives and some cautions that I'd throw out to you. Uh, approach internet offers carefully. You can buy, well, you can buy a business via Craigslist, via eBay. You'll find websites like BizBuySell and other brokering kinds of websites. 
I just say approach them very carefully because generally speaking, if somebody is taking that approach to selling their business, it's more of a desperation kind of a strategy, which might be good. If you're looking to buy a turnaround kind of a situation, you might be able to find a great deal out there. But if you're looking for a business that's already generating solid revenue, solid income, then you may, uh, well, you just may be cautious uh, about looking at those sources for buying the business. The valuation of the business. Owners always think their business is worth a lot more than it, than it really is. And I would suggest to you that on average, the normal selling price for a business will be approximately three times whatever the, what's called the owner benefit is, or call it income, bonuses, distribution, any form of income that the owner is taking out of the business. It's normally about a three times whatever that number is. So if you're looking at a business that's generating $100,000 of cash flow for the owner, probably going to sell somewhere in that $300,000 range. Don't take that as an absolute because it's not, but it's a thumbnail that you might just uh, keep in the back of your mind. You have to be prepared to forensically review financials. Now, when I say forensically, I mean you need to examine those P&Ls in detail, and then you need to map those to income tax returns. People play games with P&Ls. They generally do not with the IRS. Now, if that's not an area of comfort for you, then I suggest that you hire the services of a CPA. You will find it's money well spent in determining whether or not the business is truly performing the way that you think it is financially. As I said a little bit earlier, the owner's role can be very significant in smaller businesses. So you wanna carefully evaluate the role of that owner. Uh, I have a good friend whom I help to uh, sell their business. Again, I'm not a broker and I do not do the brokering services, but I connected a buyer and a seller as I referred to in my last session, uh, I referred to it as the eHarmony matchmaker uh, for someone considering business ownership. Put these two people together and it turned out that the buyer that I had introduced to the seller wanted to take a very forensic view of the business, not only just the financials, but he wanted to talk to the uh, clientele and he wanted to talk to the employees and again, this individual said, no, I can't let you do that because if I do, I might jeopardize the true value of what my business is worth. Because this individual played a very active role in the selling cycle for his business and had relationships with all the clientele. Now, when a new owner comes in, are those clients gonna be as inclined to continue doing business? Questionable. And those were some of the concerns that my buyer had. Ultimately, the business, the deal got done. It took almost a year uh, for the transaction to finally happen. But again, you have to be very uh, astute to observing what's the owner's role in the business and how critical is it to it? And can you as a new owner uh, replicate it? Third pathway is franchises. Now, there's a few brand names over to the left. You might recognize a few of them. Obviously, McDonald's, everybody uh, knows who McDonald's is. Serta Pro is a painting company, the largest painting franchise in the, in the uh, country. Serpro, if you've ever had water damage or fire damage of any sorts, you may have had Serpro come in and do the cleanup work. If you're a guy, you may have gotten your hair cut at a sport clips. The entrepreneur source, my business, never would have thought of it as being a franchise because it's kind of a unique concept. But here's the deal with franchises. Franchises are what I would call a business in a box. What they do is they give you a brand name, they give you all the systems and everything related to that brand and allow you to leverage their system because they have proved, proven that it works. And that is the value of a franchise is that you're, well, it's a win-win relationship for most everybody because the franchisor is looking to grow their business, you are looking to grow your business as a small business owner, you partner together in that relationship. They give you support. They give you uh, a, a defined marketing system, a strategy. In today's age, one of the things that can be really, really uh, difficult to get your arms around is this thing called digital marketing. Most business to today, businesses today operate on the premise of using digital marketing to promote their business. If that's not an area of familiarity or comfort for you, uh, again, franchise might make sense because they put that package together for you and help you to actualize it. The concept of franchising is all built around local ownership. 
Franchisors are not successful unless you are successful and nobody knows the local market better than you likely do. Now back to some numbers. The 29 million, roughly 5%, uh, 5 to 8% of the business units uh, fall into this category of franchises. They drive uh, better than 40% of the dollar volume created uh, that, that uh, $20 trillion, 40% plus is driven through franchising. You might be surprised to know that one out of every seven people that are employed are employed in a franchise food chain of some sorts. There are thousands and thousands of franchises out there. They represent pretty much every industry you can think of, all sorts of models, home-based, vehicle-based, a retail, business-to-business, -business, a blend, lots of different variety to them. Investment, anywhere from eh, $20,000, $30,000, all the way up to multi-millions. If you had ambitions of getting into a Culver's, for example, probably upwards of $4 million if you uh, uh, lived in the Chicago area, which is where uh, we're located. So those are three different methodologies and approaches to how you can get into business to yourself. You got to get back to this key question that I asked you in, in part one. Are you truly an entrepreneur or are you a better manager? Now there's a overlap between those two typically. Entrepreneurs are risk takers. They uh, are idea people. They're visionary kind of individuals. Other people are just much better at managing people and processes. So I would suggest as you think about which of these options make sense, it probably makes sense to look at all of them. But if you're a risk taker, hey, you're probably not gonna be happy unless you're doing your own thing. However, if you're more of a risk avoider, buying something that exists already, buying into a, a franchise. And again, you never own a franchise, you only license the rights to use their system. And so you just have to ask yourself, where am I on that spectrum? Risk taker, risk avoider. So the next session, part three of this series is gonna focus on what are some of the keys to success for establishing your business? I suggest you take a break and hopefully you'll come back for part three and we'll share some additional insights with you. Thanks so much for listening.